such a chancellor, Dr. Mrs. Chancellor Watkins, Vice Chancellor Dr. Kungiria, other respected faculty members present, and dear students. I'm very happy to be in Hindustan University for giving me this very wonderful opportunity to meet the students and talk to them. And possibly time permits even to have some interaction, if possible. I feel always very happy in the midst of young engineers. And I thought I should share with them my own experience, how I have come up from a student, engineering student, to almost a well-respected technocrat of this country. Share my experience with you. And this I'll be doing, recounting my role in some of the very major infrastructure projects of this country, particularly the Congan Railway, the Delhi Metro, Cochin Metro, etc. I'll briefly explain these two, three projects to you and then tell you what lessons, what experience, what lessons we can learn the way these projects were planned and executed. Congan Railway, as you are all aware, is a 760 kilometer long broad gauge line from Bombay to Mangalore along the west coast of the country. The line passes through one of the most difficult terrains ever encountered in the history of railway construction in our country. Which will be evident to you when I mention for constructing this railway line as many as 93 tunnels to a total length of 83.5 kilometers had to be dug through one of the most difficult geological regions of the, of the, of the country. The longest tunnel on this line is 6.5 kilometers and there are nine, nine tunnels more than 3 kilometers in length. And then, as many as 158 major bridges have to be constructed. A major bridge in railway technology, railway parlance means anything more than 60 meter, 60 feet in length. The longest bridge on this line is two kilometers near Karwa. And the highest viaduct on this line is named Panwal, whose piers are as tall as Uttar Bida, almost 68 meters high, the piers. And there are about more than 6,000 minor bridges to be constructed. In spite of these technical challenges in modern constructing this railway line, we have been able to incorporate some of the frontline technologies in the construction of Congan Railway. Many of you may not know that Congan Railway is the only line in this country which has a speed potential of 160 kilometers per hour. Unfortunately, we don't have trains today till this T19 has come, T18 has come. We are no trains people are running beyond 120 kilometers. In spite of these difficult and other <coughs> challenge in Congan Railway was that the funds required for constructing this line, the government gave only one third of the cost of the project, and two third of the cost of the project had to borrow from the market. The first time railway and big railway line was constructed with borrowed money. In spite of all these problems, this line was constructed with an incredibly short period of seven years. The other project is the Delhi Metro. 
for your information, Delhi Metro is not the first metro in the country. That distinction goes to Calcutta, where a metro line was started in 1973. And I had the privilege and opportunity to be associated in the initial planning and design of the Calcutta Metro, but not in its actual execution. The Calcutta Metro, even though it was started in 1973, and which is only about 19, 17 kilometers in length, it was completed only in 1996. It means it took almost 22 years for completion, the 17 kilometers, and the cost went up by 14 times. And the worst experience was when Calcutta Metro was being constructed, the city was put to a lot of inconvenience and difficulties. The central avenue of Calcutta was simply blocked for years and years. There were a few house collapses, and there were very many problems in constructing the Calcutta Metro. Therefore, when Delhi Metro and Calcutta Metro was planned and executed by as a departmental work of Indian Railways. That is why it took so much of time. Therefore, when Delhi Metro was conceived, it was decided to entrust it to a special purpose vehicle known as Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, which is a government company owned 50% by Government of India and 50% by Delhi Government. After I completed, or before I completed the Cobran Railway, I was asked to take up the responsibility of the Delhi Metro. Remember, for a few months, I was handling both Cobran Railway as well as Delhi Metro. When we took up Delhi Metro, we decided that Delhi being the capital of the country, we should go for a world-class metro with the latest technologies available in the country. At the same time, we realized that this country did not have any experience or expertise to plan and execute, plan, design and execute a world-class metro. Therefore, we had to seek assistance of foreign consultants to start with. But the success of the Delhi Metro was that we took the assistance of the foreign consultants only in the first phase of Delhi Metro. And subsequent phases of Delhi Metro, or indeed for various other, uh, other metros coming up in the country today, there are 15 cities having metros either under construction or nearing completion. For that, we did not depend upon foreign consultants at all. Delhi Metro Rail Corporation was able to completely imbibe the technology, naturalize it, localize it, I would say, and use it in other cities of the country. Which means Delhi Metro was able to set really a virtual metro revolution in the country itself. When the Delhi Metro was handed over to DMRC for the Zigo the mandate from the government was to finish the project, first phase of the project, in 10 years' time, as was envisaged in the detailed project report for the first phase of Delhi Metro. When I took over, all of us decided that Delhi, being the capital of the country, cannot wait for 10 years for a metro system to come. Therefore, we decided that we would complete the first phase of the metro in seven years. A decision taken by DMRC itself. Not at the insistence of the government, not at the persuasion of the government, or compulsion of the government. On our own, we decided we would finish in seven years' time. I am happy to inform you that we exceeded 
the time limit of seven years by three months. And even then, <laughs> we were able to complete the metro two years and nine months ahead of the schedule. And what is more important, finish the project within the estimated cost of 10,500 crores. Within the estimated cost. Now, Kochi Metro is a recent <coughs> project, which is about 24 kilometers in long. And 18 kilometers of Kochi Metro has been completed and thrown open to public. And that was the fastest first section of any metro completed in the country so far. In four years, 18 kilometers were done. Now, what I want to place before you is, all these are government ventures done by government companies, government projects, and necessarily we have to follow governmental rules, governmental procedures, and governmental guidelines. How is that possible for these projects to be completed in time or before time? and within the estimated cost. This is what I would like to share with you. My young friends, this is only due to the unique work culture which we are able to create in these organizations, whether it's Dell, Commonwealth Railway Corporation, or Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, or <coughs> the MRC handling the Kuchi Metro. And this what culture, the cardinal pillars of this what culture are just four. One is punctuality, the other is integrity, third, professional competence, and fourthly, a commitment to the society. These are broad <coughs> areas of the work culture. I'll go into other areas also a little later. But on these four items, I want to well spend a little more time with you because it will be very, very useful to be young engineering graduates coming out of this university. First of all, punctuality. When I say punctuality, it means not a minute journey or minute late. In the engineering profession, punctuality has got a great message or great meaning. Doing things in time. In fact, I learned this virtue of punctuality from my own engineering college, where I studied at Government Engineering College in Kwasinada. We had a professor by name, Professor C. Babari. A stickler in punctuality. He will come for lectures, suppose the lecture is to start at 11 o'clock, he will be just before, outside the classroom, exactly at 10.58, but will not enter the class. He will wait for 11 hours to enter the class. And the lecture is over exactly who will be. And he was so fastidious about the word punctuality. Ladies and gentlemen, or my young friends, punctuality is a virtue which every engineer should have. In projects, particularly, first of all, bear with me, in projects, time is money. If you don't finish the project on time, if there's a time overrun, there's a cost overrun automatically. And the poor taxpayer has to pay for is all of us, which we cannot allow. Punctuality does not mean merely completion of the process on time. For an engineer, anything that he does should be very, very punctual, even if it's an official appointment or official engagement, <coughs> or even a private family engagement, punctuality is very important. Please understand, punctuality is nothing but a courtesy you show to others. 
it is nothing but the value and respect you give to the time of others. This you should practice early in your life. It's very easy to practice. If you are punctual, it makes things very easy for everybody. This morning we had a special convocation celebrity here in the same hall. How punctually the ceremony was conducted. I was so happy to see that. The second item which I want to mention is integrity. When I say integrity, it is not merely just honesty or absence of corruption. It is something much more beyond that. If you take the Oxford Dictionary will see the meaning of integrity. It will show that integrity means having high good moral values. This is integrity. Now, in our engineering profession, where we have interaction with various forces outside, a lot of outside external factors have got to be taken control of. Integrity of engineer is very, very important. This is one thing particularly I want to appeal to the students here that integrity should be the cornerstone of the art stone in your value arts culture. If you have that integrity or reputation for integrity, you can take very bold decisions. And if you, even if you make a mistake, others will not attribute any man, manifest motives to the decision. It will be controlled. I don't like to go the various incestors in my own career where mistakes have been committed but for that nobody had found fault in me later on. In Chennai itself, when I was chief engineer construction in Southern Railway, <coughs> the suburban terminal was <coughs> constructed. Many of you may not know that there was no approval or sanction for the permanent building, such an eight-story building. But it was done legally according to the rules. What I did was I was handling so many projects in that time in Southern Railway. And each project had a head for overhead charges. I compounded all these overhead charges, made it into one, and constructed <coughs> that <coughs> more market, the old more market suburban terminal. There were questions raised. There were audit errors on that. But simply because of the reputation I had for integrity, I was able to get over all those problems. This should be, according to me, the passport in your pocket, integrity. A reputation for integrity is so essential for any engineer. With that, as I told you, you have confidence to take decisions. You can face any situations. That is, must be the watchword. in your professional ethics. <clears throat> when I was completing the first phase of Delhi Metro, the first section when we were open, opening, a very famous person wanted to see the line before it was open even. And I took him on this section. The first section was only about eight and a half kilometers. Took him. And while coming out, he asked me one question. Sri Varan, can you tell me in one word the secret of your success? 
I waited for some time and told him, so it is integrity, nothing else. This is, this is what I want students to understand early in your career. And this should be throughout your career, this value for integrity. The third item I mentioned was professional competence. Professional competence means whatever job you take up, you should be well versed, you should be thorough with that, that job. If you know your job well, naturally again you have such confidence to take decisions, self-assurance for anything that you do. Not only that, if you know your job very well, your subordinates will adore you. Your, so your uh, bosses, people, superiors, they will be always wanting to patronize you. And your colleagues will worship you. I can tell you this. Now, how do you get this professional competence? This is only by keeping yourself impressed of the technology, whatever is happening. This morning, I made a statement that for an engineer, education is a lifelong pursuit. This is particularly so for engineers. Throughout your life, there are occasions to learn things. Anywhere you go, there are things to learn. This morning when I was sitting here, more than listening to the lectures, I was watching the roof of this particular hall, how it has been constructed. This sort of being is again initiative as it should be always there. And innovation, only through knowledge you think of innovation, something better, how to do it better. Is such for new ideas, new concepts, new technology. This will be always in your mind. Please remember, you are an engineer. Throughout your waking life, of course, during sleep, you don't do any engineering. Waking to anything, that engineering instinct of power, that should be at uppermost in your mind. You go to a railway platform, immediately see how this is going to be even a symbol, a photo of it is constructed. What is the theory behind it? You see the engine rolling in. What is the type of brakes that are using? This sort of thing is used to be in your mind all the time. How the train is stopped? Is it vacuum brakes? Is it <coughs> pressure brakes? That is compass, uh, the compression brakes? This will be in your mind, and if you don't get the answer, find out from someone. Similarly, any literature you find, in your field, immediately get, try to get over it. If you are a master of your own subject, as I told you, there are tremendous advantages. Now, I am basically a civil engineer. And Metro is a highly complicated, complicated technology. The civil engineering part of it, in terms of cost, I mean, it is high. But in terms of technology content, it is an electrical, mechanical, signaling, telecommunication, which is a bigger content. I was, how, I, how was that I was able to manage and execute this project without any problem? Because I started learning, find out. What are the problems? How can you solve? If you don't know it, get somebody who knows it and <coughs> learn from you. This is possible in our engineering profession. Lots of people of skill, experts are available. So this professional competence is an important thing. This should be a bunch of you. I should be the best in my field any time. And the fourth thing I mentioned was a commitment to society. 
van je niet kwijt. Die aim of education or education should not be merely to get a job. It should not merely to earn a living. You should have an ambition much more than that. This is an opportunity for you to serve the society and through the society serve your country. That should be your ambition. Your success in professional life does not depend upon the high salary that you draw, the high position you occupy, or the huge bank balance that you build up. It does not depend upon that. Your success depends upon what you have done to make a change in the quality of life of the people in the country. How you have been able to your knowledge, your experience, how you are able to give it to the society. And that is that has more <coughs> satisfaction than working for itself. This commitment to society. Now this commitment to society can come out in many ways. It can be in the form of, say, executing a project, a daily project, a daily metro project, or a common railway project. For consistent common railway, we have to acquire land from more than 40,000 land owners. Can you imagine that? 40,000 land owners. And nobody would like to part with this land within it, even if it is an eminent project. But explaining to them the benefit of the project, how it will change their life and the life of the, the the village or the town, convincing them we were able to take over the lands of more than 90,000 of people, 90% of the people within eight months they were able to take over the land. Why simply contacting them? Of course, in so doing, we were not simply following the land acquisition proceedings or land acquisition goals. We were adopting a very proactive attitude in taking over the land. In the sense, we know that if the land is being taken over, he has certain problems. Find out those problems and see whether you can solve those problems in advance. And make it easy for him to hand out the land. That's what I mentioned, <coughs> proactive stand in land acquisition. That was in the form of, for example, somebody had house had to be acquired. We used to go and tell him that what it is meant for the people of this area. It is not meant for the common railway. And if you have got a problem that you don't have a place to stay, we will find a place for you to shift your family first. We will pay the rent for that house for at least six to eight months. And when you build your new house at a new location, we will see that all the <coughs> doors and windows and tiles which could be salvaged from the old house we will transfer it to a new place. This sort of proactive stand we took, that is how we were able to take out the language. But this, what I said, a commitment to society. The other thing is cutting the trees. In a place to Delhi, Metro Delhi, to cut a tree is very, very difficult to get permission. Ultimately, permission has to be given by the Lieutenant General the African governor of Delhi state, he only has the power to give permission to cut a tree. We got on the problem quickly by putting a, a proposition before the government. For every tree we cut, we will plant 10 trees as compensatory afforestation. 10 trees, some other place we plant. We will acquire the land for that purpose, plant the trees and look after them for five years. On that assurance and we were able to get permission to cut the trees. This is what I call a social commitment. And when we were building the Delhi Metro, we did not want to repeat the experience of Calcutta. 
but people are put a lot of inconvenience and difficulties when you make <coughs> roads were blocked and construction was going on. We did in such a way that minimum inconvenience to the people when the work is taken up. We used to barricade the work sites with green boats to give the effect of greenery and confine ourselves only within the barricades. We did not allow any dust or uh, dirt to go onto the road. We will see that the traffic is properly handled, not by ourselves, not by the traffic police. We have used to have our own traffic borders, guiding the traffic, improve the junctions in advance if necessary, put up additional signal lights if necessary, see that the traffic moves very smoothly. Then he was easy to manage that. That was not so in, in Kuchi when we took up the Kuchi work. But Kuchi districts are already very well in health. But even then, we, we took all the measures necessary to see that the inconvenience to people of is the minimum. We used to ensure that no dust is created, no pollution, sound pollution, vibration pollution, this sort of things are not created. If we had to do such work, we used to do it only during daytime so that night, sleep is not disturbed of the people. This sort of precaution we are taking. With the result, there were no complaints even when tunneling was being done. We know the houses, residents of houses, there were no complaints at all. All this, I would say, is a social responsibility. There will be no regulations or no directives from the government of survey. The engineer should himself realize that he is doing a project for the society and should not trouble the society. See whatever is possible. All the mitigating measures should be taken. This is social responsibility. These are the four major pillars of the work culture of these organizations. But there is something more that I want to convey to students, particularly in present day. Dear young friends, we should realize that an engineer's profession is a demanding profession. It is not an easy profession. And if you want to rise up to the challenges of this profession, first and foremost is, apart from the traits I mentioned about the work culture, first and foremost is good health. The importance of health for an engineer, you should realize right from this institute complex. Unless you are healthy, you will, you will not be productive. If you are sick all the time, you are a problem for the organization you are working, you are a problem for your family, you are an anxiety for your spouses all the time, you must have good health. And to have good health, there are only three, four precautions one has to take. Learn it early in your life. What things are required? First and foremost is good nourishing food in moderate size, moderate portions. Good food. All of you are working, all of us are studying and going for a profession only to ensure that we get our food properly, our families properly looked after. It's only for the purpose. So don't neglect your food habit. The second is adequate sleep. In the current, these days, what I find is students, the old adage, early to sleep, early to bed, early to rise, is not there at all. This is very necessary. You must have your coat of sleep. It may be seven hours for some people, it may be eight hours for some people, it may be even nine hours for some of them. You must ensure it. Don't waste your time in front of TV unnecessarily, with your cell phone unnecessarily. These are the distractions to the present generation in fact. They are necessary when you really need it. TV, yes, 
you want to know the, the headlines for the news, what is happening in the country. Okay. Phones, your parents will be able to contact you whenever you are required. But don't spend your time and energy on the distracting areas. That is what I said, ampers me. And the third, third most important thing is enough exercise. It may be that as an engineer in your own profession, you may have to go up and down, walk quite a lot, climb stairs. That is not exercise. That is work. Exercise is, if you take out at least half an hour a day for recharging yourself. And that is, and it can be in the form of aerobic exercises, it can be in the form of brisk walks, or it can be in the form of yoga. <coughs> Combination of these things, one day yoga, one day exercise. But this is very important. You must develop this habit. I am in good health. Looking around me, I am not very much angry to see really very, very agile and healthy faces in front of me. It is necessary for my young friends. Health is very, very important. And another factor is good character. <coughs> Morning also I mentioned. The crown and glory of life is character. Good character, good character, amiable, pleasant to others, be helpful to others, and most important, respect for elders, respect for your teachers, respect for your parents, friendliness around, wherever you are working, your house, working, anyone. These good habits you should pick up. I always have felt that institution like this should not merely be for creative engineers. They should also be equally good creating good and responsible engineers. Good ethics, good values, good principles should be instilled. We get the values in our life initially from our home, our own parents, our elders. But that's only for a short period. Thereafter, we spend more time in education institutions. These education institutions should be able to impart your good values and good principles. Ladies and gentlemen, there are certain things in our life we, which we can't change. Or, such as, you can't change your complexion. Whatever is your complexion you have vomit, you have to live with that. You can't change your facial features. You can't change your stature, height. But there are, there are certain things you can certainly change, like having good health, having good character, good conduct. Is you can always change, acquire it, all with very disciplined, good principles in your life. This is a message I want to give to you. You are very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to get education in the institution of this type. When you leave the institution, please seek the blessings of your professors and teachers. And before you take up any profession, please take the blessings of your parents. You will see that you enter your whole career with different with these blessings that you get. And <clears throat> finally, please remember the institution you are studying. Your whole career. The whole future depends upon what you have gained from an institution of this type. When you are in good, affluent jobs, when you are able to help your alma mater, 
ಸೀದ ಮತ್ತವರು ಬೇರೆಯವರಿಗೆ ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ I'm happy. I got this opportunity to talk to the upstairs and I thank the University for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for sharing your valuable thoughts with us and inspiring us to aspire to something much more than worldly success. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, I just wanted to add one point to this. I was uh, working in Delhi when the Delhi Metro was under construction. The building which I was working was a 10-story building, which is number one building. Right under the building, the Delhi Metro was constructing the line as well as the railway station. I did not experience any difficulty during my stay three years Delhi, in spite of the fact that the construction was happening. I mean, we knew that the construction is happening because the people would like to move out. They had made diversions and things like that. But no issue during the three and a half years of my working in that building during the period that Delhi was doing in the second phase of the construction. And that is to vouch what he said. The second point which I just wanted to tell is that he has given you very good uh, advices. I just wanted to say that uh, we have uh, a value statement which is integrity, innovation and internationalization. So integrity is the one which we give importance. So thank you very much sir.